A moment arrives on Earth when all its inhabitants find themselves in a massive 140-story bunker. But who built it and why they are forced to hide no one knows as all information has been destroyed. The sheriff's wife decides to uncover the truth, thereby igniting a chain of disobedience. Sheriff Beckett Holston removes his badge, tidies up the room and steps out onto the galleries of the shelter. No one knows why people are here, who built it and why the world outside is as it is. No one knows when it will be possible to go outside, but that day clearly has not yet arrived. Arriving at his office, Holston writes a letter and asks his assistant to go into isolation after having coffee. He himself goes through the door, closes the gate behind him and throws away the key. To his surprised assistant, he says that he wants to join his wife, whose body lies behind a dusty porthole beyond opening. To declare his desire to leave the shelter is tantamount to voluntary exile, that is, death. And while the dumbfounded assistant goes to coordinate the sheriff's statement, he remembers his wife. An ordinary morning, a couple drinks coffee and receives a long-awaited permission to have a child. The family has a year ahead to conceive and give birth to their heir. The people around congratulate the couple on the wonderful event. Suddenly, Gloria, an eccentric older woman known as a charlatan, comes to their table and asks Ellison to come to her room. She would gladly help in trying to conceive and carry a child. But Holston chases her away. The woman herself is childless. How can she help? Later, the couple goes to the doctor, who removes a contraceptive capsule from Allison. Now she has every chance of becoming a mother. Moreover, this is the last, third attempt. The countdown begins, but so far, the couple has not achieved any results, despite the fact that Allison follows all the advice of those around her. One day, the woman's boss reprimands her. She posted an article about deleted files on old drives online without consulting him. The article is removed and she should know that this is a serious violation as people are forbidden to restore antiques. Later, Allison shares the incident with her husband. She doesn't understand why it's not allowed to post information about materials deleted by the rebels. After all, the mayor constantly reminds everyone about the sanctity of history and the memory of generations. And the law enforcers send anyone who has a relic of old times to the mines. Holston asks to obey the law because if a handful of violators want to take a look at the outside world and open the hatch, it's the end of the shelter. Ellison disagrees with her husband, but she has other concerns as time goes by but she still can get pregnant. Freedom Day arrives, a holiday celebrated after the last rebellion. The bunker's mayor is concerned that the external lens is getting dirtier. On the one hand, this is good because it means that there are no criminals among the residents who are sent for cleaning. But on the other hand, people should be able to see the outside world. At this time, Gloria lures Ellison into her room, where, with all precautions, she asks the woman about the broken servers and burned books. Did the rebels really do this and why? And she announces that Ellison will never be able to have children. She simply will not be allowed. Later, Allison relays this conversation to her husband, but he advises her not to believe the crazy old woman. On the same day, the woman receives an order to work in a small workshop of the city programmer. Today is Freedom Day, but her husband is on duty, so she is ready to work the allotted time. Allison goes to the workshop through the festive galleries, where performances are taking place, people are drinking and having fun. She is enthusiastically greeted by the programmer, George. He had long awaited to consult specifically with her because he read her post about deleted files. And he shows her a forbidden thing, an old hard drive. He managed to launch it, but he can't read the files. Ellison gets to work. Meanwhile, the mayor gives a congratulatory speech, praising the laws of the shelter. Exactly 140 years ago, they defended their freedom, forbidding the rebels to open the doors to the outside world. They destroyed all information about past life, but the founding heroes saved the remnants of civilization. At this time, Allison manages to launch the disc, but the woman gets scared and leaves, asking George to destroy the relic. 
People on the galleries are rejoicing, celebrating their victory, while George is examining the plan of the entire huge shelter and finds an unknown tunnel at the very bottom. Ellison joins her fellow citizens who commemorate the ancestors and launch flying lanterns, but her head is occupied with a new discovery and she can't think of anything else. Her husband notices her condition, but she excuses herself with fatigue. The next day, Allison asks for a leave from work and goes to Gloria to find out why she has been denied children. Later, she tells her husband about her desire to take a day off and just go for a walk, but she herself goes to George and asks him to show her everything. Opening one of the files, the two of them are amazed, so this is what's outside. Returning home, Allison receives a message from the doctor, time is up and they need to go to the appointment tomorrow. The woman asks her husband to wait for her there, but Holston waits in vain in the waiting room. Allison never comes. The man goes to work, but she's not there either. Then he runs home and finds his wife sitting at the table. She asks him for a conversation. She tells him that they will never be allowed to have children because the elite need obedient and submissive citizens. He is a man of law and she couldn't speak without evidence, but now there is evidence. And Allison shows a contraceptive capsule she cut out herself. The doctor deceived them. Seeing blood, Holston runs for the doctor, but when they return, Allison is no longer in the room. They find her in the dining room, where she publicly accuses the government of hiding the truth about the actual situation outside and utters forbidden words about wanting to leave the bunker. By law, they are forced to kick her out, and the sheriff has to arrest his own wife. The mayor tries to think of some way around the law, but there is no way out. There were too many witnesses. The law enforcement officers search Gloria's home and George's workshop, but find nothing incriminating. No one understands what prompted the woman to think this way, but they proceed with the tradition. While they're preparing a spacesuit for Allison, Holston doesn't leave her cell, and the woman tries to convince him that she hasn't gone mad and knows what she's doing. The picture is simply altered. The authorities have the capabilities for that. She reminds him that all exiles must clean the lens of the external camera, so if everything is really dead outside, she won't do it. And if the world is alive, she will wipe the glass and it will be a signal for him. If everything is as she thinks, Allison will go up the hill, find out the truth and come back for him. The moment of exile comes, Allison is put into the spacesuit, and a special rag for cleaning the lens is split into her pocket. Holston reads the traditional farewell words and cries, hearing his wife's last words in which she confesses her love for him. The helmet is fastened on the woman, and she heads outside. Hundreds of people watch her on the monitors. There she appears before the screen, and she cleans the lens. Then she smiles into the face of her astonished husband and walks towards the dried tree on the hill. But before reaching it, she falls and remains motionless. Two years pass. One day, the assistant reports to the sheriff about George's death, who, after Allison's exile, transferred to the lower level, to the mechanics. The guy fell from the gallery. The woman working with George refuses the idea of extreme act of despair. She is an engineer who is confident that the man was killed. The sheriff inspects the body of the deceased and goes to the lower level to talk to the witness. And now, sitting behind bars waiting for exile, he admits that it was after meeting Juliet that he learned to listen, something Allison could never achieve from him. So he is ready to go and find his wife. The astonished assistant points to the figure outside the window, but Holston is sure it's not Allison. The day of exile comes. Holston apologizes for the disturbance, says goodbye to the assistant, and walks towards the bunker door. He ascends the long corridor while people gather in the dining room to see the sheriff's last hours. And he, looking at the world around him, realizes Allison was right. Everything around is greening, birds are singing, and the sun is shining. And he starts wiping the lens. The audience rejoices, the ritual is complete. But the sheriff goes to his wife's body, and it's clear that he's feeling unwell. To the audience's surprise, he pulls the helmet off his head and crawls towards the tree, but he falls next to it. Juliet is furious, he deceived them. 
The sheriff's death excites the people. Riots start, but the law enforcement officers calm the population down. Julia descends and screams, letting out her anger. Meanwhile, the sheriff assistant reads his last order to appoint Juliet to his position. The man goes to the mayor while Juliet is fully immersed in her work on the lower level. The sheriff's assistant finds the mayor knitting things for a newborn. The woman laments she used to do this 25 times a year and now there are barely five. She is very upset that she sent the sheriff for cleaning, which has never happened in the history of the bunker. And she can't find his replacement yet, as the assistant refuses to take the position. All this time, she's been reviewing the mayor's logs, and she realizes that she knows nothing about the cause of the rebellion. The woman is worried about the emotional state of the population. And she has reason to worry. People are buying up hammers and moles en masse. And quarrels are breaking out on the streets more and more often, which the law enforcement officers are still handling. One day, Juliet comes to her friend, a repairwoman. She immediately notices the woman's anger and excitement and asks her to share her problems. And after some hesitation, Juliet admits that it's about George. She is convinced that he was killed because he wanted to show his something during their last meeting. George didn't want others to know about their relationship, so he didn't come to the repairman's party. But he did pop in for a minute to arrange a meeting with her in the evening. Juliet came home late, but George was not in his room. However, there was a bag with an incomprehensible rarity inside and a note where he asked her to recall the place where she saw this trinket. In the morning, the woman walked into the dining room, catching sympathetic glances and didn't understand what had happened. It was only over breakfast that she learned about the death of her beloved. After recovering from the initial shock, she goes to the lawman and reports the murder of the programmer. He takes it to the sheriff. They inspect the scene together and the girl again insists that George couldn't have ended his life himself. Everything happened late at night and the only witnesses could have been couriers. Holston also pays attention to her watch, but Juliet assures him that that's not rarity. The girl examines George's body but doesn't find any unusual injuries. Later they talk over lunch and the sheriff asks her to tell him everything, promising not to disclose any forbidden secrets to superiors. Julia takes him to her room and shows him the toy that George left her. But she hands over the note in a shortened form. And then she takes him to the very lowest tiers where the sheriff has never been and didn't even imagine that this place existed. The woman opens a secret passage, the walls of which are covered in writings and drawings of those who lived there before the rebellion. Having passed through it, the couple descend a metal staircase and enter a huge cave beneath the bunker. Julia turns on the light and Holston looks around in amazement at the gigantic machine standing in the middle of the cave. Apparently, this is an underground combine with which unknown ancestors created this refuge. Anything of value from it was removed long ago. And for the first time, she realized how little they knew about the shelter and those who created it. The couple descend onto the machine where George had set up a living area for himself. He stored the relics he found here. And he didn't want to make their relationship public so that no suspicions would fall on her if he was arrested. Julia shows Holston her friend's treasures, then suddenly notices a wire wound on a reel leading somewhere off the platform. Julia pulls it out and finds a bag at the end containing a hard drive. Nearby are notes made by Allison's hand, which the sheriff immediately recognizes. It turns out that his wife knew everything that was happening but didn't tell him. Holston demands to send the rarities to the furnace before anyone knows about their existence. But Juliet is against this and unintentionally repeats his wife's words about his inability to listen to people, which sobers the sheriff. He admits that he can go through the dining room because he can see her body under the tree through the window. And he advises the woman to lay low while he finds out the truth. Her friend shakes her head. Juliet was harsh with the sheriff, so he didn't fully trust her. Then the woman admits that she didn't show Holston everything. There was a continuation in the note. 
George wrote that he found what he was looking for, but it's thousands of times more dangerous than anything that's come before. Juliet leaves, hearing a wish to stay alive, and the sheriff's deputy confesses to the mayor that Holston left a successor. Only he's so puzzled by this candidate that he didn't want to talk about her. The mayor plans to meet with the woman, while Juliet herself recalls a conversation with George, when he jokingly confessed that the bundles of ropes on the combine would help him go back in time. He found an old blueprint and a tunnel located underwater. He intended to swim in it, holding onto a rope. The woman heads to the cave and, lowering the rope, descends on it to the very surface of the water at the foot of the machine. The idea of humanity surviving in a closed bunker is not new, but there is a clear anticipation of something completely unexpected and incredible. In general, we are waiting for the next episodes.